visit our refreshments upstairs after this seminar and uh, Professor Balpe will be upstairs to answer all questions. <laughs> so I'm really uh, happy to have a uh, warm welcome to a newcomer to this uh, university. Uh, Professor Valky Bill joined us, uh, when was it? Like six months? Uh, Mid-June. Mid-June. Not too long ago. And um, from uh, UCSF, San Francisco. And I think we first met on uh, study section. Yeah, I think the study so section. Called cardiovascular A, yeah. CVA. Yeah, we met on study section. And, um, Bill was the expert on um, cellular calcium and excitation contraction coupling and how calcium can cause arrhythmias at the cellular scale. And uh, as far as his history and biography, uh, he received his MD from uh, Temple University in Pennsylvania, then uh, residency at Hopkins, fellowship at Brigham, right? Um, and then, oh, there was an interlude. You were with, you were in University of Maryland. Yes, yeah, well, I was, I was in Maryland in Hopkins. Of the I did a postdoc in uh, uh, yeah. physiology. Right. Was John there? there? John was there, and I was with Bill Weir. That's a story. Enough. Good story, but <laughs> I'll tell you later. All right, so without further ado, thank you. Oh, and, and Bill is not only a professor of cardiology, he is also the chief of uh, cardiology in the VA downtown. So, welcome. Thank, thank you very much. And I particularly appreciate the warm welcome, considering how cold it's been and how freezing I was last Friday when I, when I left. Um, just to uh, expand on the background, thank you for that, Jefferson. So um, I did uh, a combination of clinical and laboratory stuff for a number of years until I got very misdirected into doing science administration about 10 years ago. And I went uh, to a, a couple different universities and I got swallowed in their CTSA projects, which is a, a very large NIH initiative to support clinical and translational science on sort of the, the other arm of basic science research. And, on the surface, it sounded really, really wonderful. It was articulated by Sarhuni in 2003, and it really caught um, the clinical physician scientist community by a storm. And huge grants went out. Uh, some of them, like the one that I wrote at UCSF, was for $122 million. Others that I wrote were more modest, did $20 million. But these dwarfed anything that we had ever seen in our study section. And it was like, I felt like, you know, uh, uh, Don Quixote chasing a windmill. Because uh, I thought it would really give uh, uh, an opportunity to take the discoveries we had all been making or contributing to, at least in our basic science labs, and move them much more quickly into uh, uh, applications that would benefit human health and, and help us treat a variety of different diseases. But like all ideals, like, um, like uh, communism, which is a wonderful ideal when you think about it. In practice, it turned out to be a nightmare. And I think after 10 years, as I've watched the CTSAs uh, percolate through time and the various institutions I've been at, I think they haven't lived up to their promise. So I finally woke up and saw the light uh, last year. And thanks to, to Jeanine and Doug and a bunch of other people, I decided to go back to my roots and come back and, and leave that kind of administrative stuff aside try to get back and do it in the lab. So I'm going to describe to you, and this is going to be somewhat directed to uh, the postdocs um, and, uh, and trainees, because it's going to show uh, how you can come back to something uh, and it can still be there and still have potential. So as Norm said, my areas of interest historically have really been in excitation contraction coupling. We've been very interested in the stochastic relationship between calcium entry through l calcium channels and calcium release from the SR uh, calcium release channel of the RAN receptor. And we've had a lot of fun with that over the years. And 
we looked at normal cardiac muscle, and we looked at the less than stochastic relationship with those two calcium signaling channels in uh, a variety of pathologic models, including hypertrophy and failing cardiac muscle. And we've looked at models of pressure overload and volume overload, and uh, even though phenotypically those hearts look the same, the etiology of their dysfunction actually uh, has a very different uh, molecular phenotype. And we've also extended some of our studies to atrial muscle. Um, it was actually this work that led us into what I want to talk about today. It was really a serendipitous observation uh, that when I was just beginning, before we did any of the stuff uh, on Sparks, that my mentor said, oh, that's just crap. Just forget it, just put it away. Uh, it doesn't mean anything, it's an artifact of your preparation. And I, like all good postdocs, was stubborn, really stubborn. And I just put it away, and I did what I was told to do, but I kept it. And I came back to it a few years later, and that's really what I want to talk about today. So I'm going to start this um, kind of like, and please, if you have questions or want clarifications, just interrupt. I mean, this, since you're at spring break, um, you can be more, less formal about it and enjoy this a little bit. And I'll try to present it in a way that we came across it. So as we were doing a lot of our EC coupling experiments, we did a lot of uh, voltage clamping in uh, some interesting ionic conditions, particularly sodium-free environments. And I noticed something that's in, in this slide that became the observation that I tucked away until we started to pursue it in earnest many, many years later. And this is uh, a picture of an experiment that we did where there's a voltage clamp records on the left in panel A and a current voltage relationship in panel B. And um, we noticed, and, and these conditions were no external sodium and one millimolar uh, external calcium. And when you step from a holding potential of minus 100 millivolts to a variety of different test potentials for 200 milliseconds, you, we noticed at a very negative test potential, uh, an inward current that uh, rapidly deactivates. And that current <coughs> increases to about minus 42 millivolts. And then as you continue your test potentials more positive, this starts to diminish. And then it goes up again, but it's a very different kind of current. It's a slower uh, current, and its inactivation it is, takes much longer than these currents. So we, when you plot them on the current voltage relationship, you get this kind of relationship. You get a current that activates very negatively, rapids rising, or rap rapidly rises, then decreases to about 30 minus 20 uh, millivolts, and then takes off again, uh, very large currents. And I only show this aspect of the current voltage relationship. So, you know. I wasn't sure what this was. My first thought was not that it was an artifact of preparation, but it was actually calcium permeation through the classical sodium channel, which we know is activated in the, under these experimental conditions if there were sodium there. It was a very plausible first guess. And we, we started to characterize this uh, using a number of very obvious uh, experimental conditions. First of all, if you take calcium out, all of these currents, both peaks completely disappear you get absolutely nothing there. Okay, so it's a calcium-dependent current. And then we started to look at various uh, known and, and easily obtained uh, uh, antagonists to the various channels. This particular arm, this first one, this rapid one, is blocked uh, completely with 10 micromolar TTX, a classical sodium channel blocker. It's also completely uh, uh, attenuated by scorpion toxin and varactyl also get channel blockers. Uh, this current here was completely untouched by any of these. And then uh, when we use calcium channel blockers, nifedipine, 50 micromolar nickel, 10 micromolar lanthanum, this completely eliminated and this remained uh, completely uh, unaffected by this. So basically, Based on this early pharmacology dependence of this, of this channel, we called it a uh, calcium channel through a, uh, calcium permeation through a TTX channel, or ICA TTX. And that's what we used from that point on. 
So then we started to really uh, begin to explore these possibilities, uh, since it wasn't clearly something that happened just when we, uh, when we eliminated uh, external sodium. So we looked at the peak uh, conductance voltage relationship with this channel, and this is uh, an example of pool data from a uh, large number of cells with conductance here and voltage here. And the experimental conditions are those that would favor uh, that fast component in the current voltage relationship uh, that I showed you in the previous slide. And there was no sodium and three millimolar calcium. And the key to these experiments is to get rid of any extraneous current with TTS, TTX subtraction. And I'll come back to that later uh, when uh, several people fail to do this and get, <coughs> get completely different results. This is a really pure way of getting uh, the, the, uh, good current resolution. And um, it's something that takes a lot of time. And depending on what you're doing, it's not something you typically need to do. But in this case, we did. So when you plot this data, you can fit it. Uh, it's best fit by a single Boltzmann function with these values. Uh, uh, D1 half of minus 47.6 millivolts, slope factor of minus 4, uh, conductance uh, of 20.26. Remember those, because I'm going to come back to them in a second as we play with this. Thing. These uh, are full data from the same cells that I just showed you, but uh, where conditions were changed. And it's the same uh, conductance voltage relationship. And the experimental conditions are different this way. We've added sodium to the external media, and we've added three millimolar calcium. So you would expect uh, uh, those things to reflect uh, what we see in the currents. If I were to show you the, the individual currents, which I won't for the sake of time. Again, all of these currents uh, and, uh, were uh, TTX subtracted, so they're really uh, without any, uh, any uh, uh, error. So in panel A, this line is a single best fit Boltzmann. And it's very clear, even from the back of the room, that this doesn't very well describe the data down here or up here at all. If you go and use the sum of two Boltzmanns, you get a very, very nice fit. And the data uh, for the first Boltzmann is very similar to what we saw in the previous slide that showed the conductance voltage relationship for calcium alone. And the data for the second Boltzmann is very, very different. So it, this is beginning to develop the, the idea that under these ionic conditions, you really have uh, two different channels. So I just I put this in a little table uh, just the other day so we can see this a little bit better. This is the first curve in calcium alone, and these are the values. And this is the peak conductance. The second curve, which is very similar in, in V and K, has <coughs> this with a different conductance. And this second component is very, very different. So here's how we interpret that, that, that the, the first component, or the ICA TTX channels, are permeable to sodium even in the presence of appreciable calcium. So this is important. Under, exter under conditions where you have both ions present, both permeate the channel uh, at, at, under those conditions. So it's not like calcium is permeating only because there's no sodium there. You can get calcium permeation simultaneously with sodium. That's why that conductance of that first one in the chart was a little different. Now, you could say, well, maybe it's calcium permeation just because you have only one millimolar of external sodium. Well, you're a little limited experimentally because it's very difficult to control these clamps when you get high concentrations of sodium. But we've actually gone up to 50 millimolar external sodium with one or two of calcium. And you can still get calcium permeation of the uh, TTX channels. Uh, so together, uh, I think we can say with a little bit more certainty now that we've developed this that these channels are sodium channels. So at this point, we, we've added another sodium channel to the list of uh, TTX blocks, uh, blockable sodium channels in particular cells. One is the classic cardiac sodium channel, the one that we all think starts the action potential, phase zero, and is that, that top little 
bar that you see under that that nice you know, uh, schematic of action potential with its contributing parts. The second is a small persistent sodium current. I'm sure many of you know it, called it, developed by Peter Gage and colleagues, uh, and published in 1994. And this is uh, a very small persistent current that's very TTX uh, uh, sensitive. And then there's the ICA TTX, which has a, a KE for TTX at about a micromolar. It inactivates completely, as you've seen. And compared with the classic cardiac sodium channels, and as you saw, it's displaced uh, uh, 10 millivolts in the negative direction. And is also, relative to the classic sodium current, less deeply dependent on memory potential. So, continuing to try to uh, look at this, we, we want to compare these uh, the functional properties and looking at current kinetics. So this is a, a graph, and I'll, I'll go through this slowly. Um, this is where we are looking at time constant inact inactivation as a function of voltage or potential. And these are uh, these are obtained from single exponential fits to the decaying phase of uh, the individual currents. And the experimental conditions, there's a variety of ones, but when we had sodium, it was one millimolar, and calcium was 0.5 millimolar, and again, these are TTX subtractions. <coughs> and uh, you can see, we saw that the inactivation of this TTX blockade occurs as two exponentials. The slow component, which is these little upward triangles right here, we attributed to ICA TTX. The fast component, these little inverted triangles right here. And if you do it in calcium only, which are these open circles, you get the much slower component exclusively. And if you do it in sodium only without calcium, you get the faster component, which these uh, components are superimposable. Therefore, again, uh, ICA TTX compared with uh, the classical sodium current has a slower inactivation and a slower inactivation. So, in calcium only, there's a single population of TTX blockable uh, currents or channels, ICA TTX, and they have very distinct voltage dependence of activation and current kinetics. When you use sodium only, there's a single population of TTX blockable channels, which is INA. And the reason why this is, because even though ICTX is permeable to sodium, why we only saw one in the previous slide is, first of all, INA is clearly more abundant than ICA TTX. And the absolute amplitude of the slow ICA TTX relaxation in sodium is completely overwhelmed uh, by uh, uh, classical sodium current. And, and by these methods, the heat is just too small for resolution. So moving on to look at steady state that activation, uh, for these two channels. This is a, a, a plot of normalized peak currents uh, during a minus 30 millivolt test pulse uh, uh, following a 150 millisecond uh, condition extent from minus 135 to minus 35, as indicated. And the upward triangles are under conditions of 3 millimolar calcium and no sodium. And then the inverted triangles are three millimolars of calcium and two of uh, sodium. And again, the, the curves are single Boltzmann and Hicks. And you can see that under conditions, these conditions, where you would expect to see ICA TTX exclusively, it shifted to the left and is much uh, less dependent on voltage as its other tracing in the presence of sodium and some calcium, where you'd expect to see, uh, or at least all that we're going to be able to distinguish is uh, the classical sodium current. So, the other thing that those experiments tell us is that these classical sodium channels have a very limited calcium permeability. And as a matter of fact, work from others have shown that uh, heterogeneously expressed uh, sodium channels have absolutely no or little <coughs> calcium permeability. And we're going to use this later as we start to probe the molecular basis for these channels. So just as to sum up again, these channels, higher calcium permeability and calcium only, the only thing you can detect is a single population of these channels. Uh, 
and it's clearly different than that of sodium. So, and and we argued backwards. If they were the same, if this ICA TTX and classical ch sodium channels were comparable, then the current time course and the activation curves should have been largely or entirely that of the classical sodium channels, owing to the much higher density. But they're not. So I, I'm far afield from my original assumption that this is just calcium permeation through the classical sodium channels as a result of the <coughs> experimental conditions. So then we wanted to look at differential uh, permeabilities. And this is a really intriguing experiment to me. And this was actually suggested to me by my colleague, uh, who was a, a biophysicist that I met at the University of Maryland, um, uh, Larry Gold. Goldsmith. Goldsmith. Uh, Goldman, I'm sorry. And he, he suggested doing this, and I, I didn't actually think of this initially, and then it made a lot of sense, because we're comparing cesium and calcium, a divalent and a monovalent. So I'll go through this kind of uh, carefully. So these are, again, TTX subtracted whole cell carbons, and the holding potential is minus 100. And we step to these different test potentials that you can see minus 54 all the way up to minus 44. Okay. The conditions are 65 millimolar of cesium, no sodium, no calcium, and you get this kind of a problem. The middle <coughs> column uh, is no cesium, no sodium, but three of calcium, and you get the same kind of current. And then what we did in the right column we took the cesium currents and the calcium currents, and we superimposed them and scaled the records, uh, scaled the records so that the peaks match. And you can see in each case here, they are superimposable. Now, one key thing that we did uh, that's very important here is we took account for differences in surface potential charge effects, and we shifted the, the uh, tracings that we superimposed uh, and scaled by the millivolts in the calcium. So we, we uh, superimposed and scaled minus 54 cesium, minus 44 calcium to get these results. If you don't do that, you don't take account of, of charge effects, differences in charge effects, you get completely spurious results, which I think is one of the, the mistake is a strong one. But one of the errors that some of our colleagues, uh, that led some of our colleagues uh, th down a primrose path of promiscuous sodium channels and a few other things. So compared with classical sodium channels, these, uh, these ICA TTX channels express appreciably higher permeability to, to cesium uh, than classical sodium channels. So we concluded, at least from these experiments, this isn't just a classic sodium channel through which some calcium leaks in the absence of sodium, but rather they have completely different permeability quantities. And what I find really interesting is you've got a channel, characterize it, and it has very definable biophysical properties that distinguish it from others, and it is permeable to both divalence and monovalence in very measurable amounts. And I just don't know of any other channel that you can say that. And again, it's been a while since I've looked at so just recapping before we get into, into some of the controversies that these channels caused at least uh, a few years ago. These channels activate and activate more slowly. The voltage dependencies for both uh, have been shifted in a negative direction and are less sleep, steeply dependent on potential. And uh, this is much more permeable to uh, a divalent calcium, a monovalent cesium, uh, for which these channels express little or absolutely no permeability, depending on who does the experiments. So we paused right here and we said, okay, this is all great, this is all nice, but what kind of um, occurrence is this? Well, is it just limited to rat ventricular cells? And I, I know a number of uh, people have gotten caught doing things in mice that aren't applicable to man or humans. And so it looks like ICA TTX from the work of our lab and the work of several others is clearly distinguishing rat and human atrial cells. We've already bridged the species gap here. 
It is found in rat, guinea pig, canine, and human ventricular cells. It's also, interestingly, in giant squid axons, and it's in rat hippocampal CA1 cells. A second type of sodium current with, that hasn't been characterized <coughs> as thoroughly as we've done about physical this has also been described in chicken rabbit ventricular cells, rabbit and canine Kinji cells, mexicola giant axons, and myelinated nerve fibers. So this made us really think, and Scott, this is what I was talking about, about the excitement of this when we started. This, it occurs widely. It's very different than the classical sodium channel. And I, I, I think you could make at least a defendable speculation that this could have a major functional significance in excitable cells in general and in cardiac cells in particular. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that, that has kept me interested <coughs> in all these years. It's a serendipitous finding of, of work that we had done in an entirely different direction. And, you know, if I, I'm still tilting at windmills, but this is, I think, a windmill that has a lot more interest than the other one I told you about. So, when this stuff was beginning to percolate and we were beginning to publish it, there were a number of uh, people, actually two doors down from us, who uh, didn't like this. And they, uh, they looked at this and they did a couple of things. And uh, one of the uh, things to question whether ICATTX is generated by stink, stink population of channels is a channel conversion proposal. And this is an interesting idea. It is basically saying you've got a channel in the membrane, and it can alter its permeability in a dynamic way, such that you change the external conditions, and that channel will change what it can do. It, and you're basically saying it's going to change its molecular structure. Intriguing idea. It's not one that I would come up with, but these are the three tenets <laughs> of this proposal. ICATTX is generated by classical sodium channels whose properties are reversibly altered by exposure to bathing media containing no calcium, but no or only very little sodium. I mean, I'm sorry, containing calcium, but no or very little external sodium. Okay. In the absence of external sodium, calcium ions would permeate sodium channels, and thus this permeation would convert classical sodium channels into ICAT. And then on restoring external sodium, these channels would reconvert back to classical sodium channels. Interesting hypothesis. One, though, that can, can be tested. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence for the sake of time, and I don't want to put you to sleep when you're spring break. I won't go through all of it. But I'll just cap. Most of the evidence falls into two categories. The experimental behavior of ICTTX was not, is not consistent with the predictions of the channel. So I'll go through some of that data. And H1 channels, uh, which is an old nomenclature, but these are the classical sodium channels, which generate uh, the sodium current. When they're expressed heteromogulously, <coughs> they do not convert to ICATTX in conditions of um, zero uh, sodium, external sodium. So those are the two basic fundamental differences. So going into some of the evidence. We can record ICATTX in uh, conditions where there's a lot of external sodium. So it is not dependent on the absence of sodium at all. I showed you some of that data as we started to characterize it, but when we go back and do it specifically, and we did these experiments deliberately to evaluate the, the uh, veracity of this proposal, and you can record it. this channel, these currents, with all the characteristics I just said, even as high as 50 millimolar sodium. And in the absence of, uh, and you can also do it in the absence of calcium, you can do it in, in the presence of cesium. So the very basic uh, <coughs> fundamentals of the conversion proposal just don't work. And if you allow for differences in surface conditions, like I showed you in that careful cesium calcium experiment we did, uh, these TTX blocks blockable cesium currents and TTX blockable calcium currents. Both have the same slope factors, and activation, inactivation, same current time course. They're identical, meaning both 
ions are going through the same channel. So, and we also have learned when we did these experiments that you take sodium out, you get your ICATTX, you reintroduce sodium. It doesn't reconvert these channels back to classical sodium channels. In fact, this doesn't decrease on the addition of, of external sodium to uh, external calcium. It actually increases with the addition of sodium, not surprisingly, because it's, it's permeated by both calcium and, and sodium at the same time. So, um, I'm, I won't go through the rest of the next slide. So, so the evidence on which this, this conversion proposal was originally based, uh, I think really arises from a couple of technical oversights. Error was too strong a word, I should have. Uh, one was the lack of, uh, the lack of understanding and the lack of utilization of TTX subtractive currents. And I think also there is some contamination of the l calcium current in some of those uh, studies when you look at the actual data in the papers. And uh, we also express these uh, H1 channels in HEK cells, and they don't convert uh, to uh, ICA TTX channels. Uh, the current time course in one millimolar sodium of calcium is identical to that in three of calcium and, and two of sodium. So they even even in this situation, there is no conversion. So I think we kind of pretty much debunk that. This is the last experiment I'll tell you for that conversion proposal. And this is again TTX contracted current records from a single. HEK293 cell that's transfected with, with H1 or, or SKIM2 or an AB1.5. The left column is uh, classical sodium current through the normal, unconverted, if you will, sodium channels. The conditions are external sodium, no calcium. You see the typical currents that I presented in the slides before. The middle column, we used experimental conditions in the same cell for which you would expect conversion to occur if it does indeed occur, and that is no sodium and three millimolar of calcium. Okay. And what we did in the right column called the strategy that I showed you in that large slide before, we superimposed these records. We shifted this, of course, uh, 10 millivolts to the, uh, uh, because of the, the surface charge surface potential, superimpose them and scale the, um, the things, and they're absolutely identical. So what this means is <coughs> here, this represents a very tiny amount of calcium permeation through unconverted sodium channels, and it displays all the properties of a classical sodium channel, not the properties of ICE. So, because that's all that's in these cells, at least as far as sodium channels are concerned. So that was kind of the proof positive. And this just says what I just said. One single TTX block of calcium current under conditions for which these cells clearly, which rat cells clearly express two currents. Okay. And so we thought that this really supported that, that these ICA TTX is a distinct channel from the classical sodium channel. And conversion is just not a viable uh, hypothesis. So once we put that to bed, and that took about a year and a half, two years to do, then there came another one. Is ICA TTX generated by protein kinase A mediated phosphorylation of classical sodium channel? So this proposal has two components. That if you expose rat ventricular cells, and this is an interesting, I'm not quite sure how they reconcile all this, to cyclic AMP or isoproteroid or cardiotonic steroids, either Wabing or digoxin, that this exposure produces a TTX blockable calcium current attributed to the induction of calcium permeability in sodium channels that normally express very little or not. So it is this cyclic AMP mediated increases by any of these that take classical sodium channels and make them permeable to calcium. And uh, that when you see ICA TTX in situations where you aren't jacking up cyclic AMP, 
that is because that is uh, represents current through a basal pool of uh, phospholipid like channels. Uh, and so this this was another interesting assault on our observations, which required us to do a lot of footage. So there's a lot of evidence against this, though, when you really think about it. So when we did these experiments, we duplicated their conditions. We used isoprotonol, one micro. It increased the TTX block current in rat intrafib cells, both in one of sodium and in five of calcium, with no detectable change in time course, which you would expect if ICA TTX were a consequence of changing the channel because of phosphorylation. And the mean ratio of the time constants of inactivations to ISO uh, to that in its absence was near you know, one, which is consistent with what I just said. Um, and the, uh, the the rest of it is, is doesn't seem to do. So again, uh, it just uh, all this these other additional experiments uh, show that this does increase ICA TTX uh, and it doesn't change the kinetics at all. So I think we can say with some authority that these channels are not produced by protein kinase A, B, A, phosphorylation, by possible sodium channels. So the real question, the $64,000 question, is um, are these channels encoded by a different gene from that encoding, encoding possible cardiac sodium channel? Is it a different isotope? And we didn't have the technology when we were doing this other than in a sense, other than but we were able to, to use that approach to get, I think, some very intriguing information that really keeps my hope alive that this is worth pursuing. These are the experimental conditions. We used adult rat ventricular cells uh, incubated for several days in primary culture uh, with antisense oligonucleotides to H1 or um, SCM2 or whatever. In a variety of different conditions, and I'll explain this. This is panel A and panel B. This is with uh, the classical sodium channel. Uh, part A is three of external sodium, four of external calcium. You see a nice family of currents. Uh, part B, we used uh, incubated with the uh, oligonucleotide, and these are TTX subtract. Again, uh, three of sodium and four of calcium. This first panel is the untreated control. You see a nice set of currents with uh, the profile that we've seen from uh, the classical sodium currents under these experimental conditions. This is a scrambled AON control. It looks nearly identical to that in the untreated control. And then you look at the AON treated cells. And these rapid inward currents are almost nearly abolished with the L-type calcium current remaining very similar to this, unaffected. So if you were to compare this with this, or this with this, there is a 69% decrement in current, or a 68% decrement in current, clearly significant compared to the AOS. In part B, we used conditions that would favor ICA TTX. So it's 140 in cesium, as we showed, because we know it's highly permeable in cesium and four of calcium just to kick that root as well. This is the family of currents that I've shown you before. No AON, no TTX. Where B is set up exactly like this, these are TTX attractive currents. There's 10 uh, micromolar of AON or uh, scramble control. And um, you can see that untreated control has this, this family of currents. The scramble control is nearly identical. AON treated after two days, not much different. If you look statistically at these, there's no significant difference. So this AON against H1, or the classical sodium channel, significantly affects the uh, classical sodium current, has no effect on ICA TTLs. And this is a bar graph showing you the same thing with the uh, maximum immune current density in pico amps or pico ferret, uh, untreated control, scramble control, and AON uh, significantly down for uh, the uh, uh, so, uh, sodium current 
L-type calcium current unaffected as you would expect. And this was a nice experiment because we had this current uh, there as a control to make sure we weren't getting non-specific effects of uh, the AON. And then ICATTX unaffected and the L-type calcium current not significantly changed. So, getting close to the end. The last thing we wanted to do is see what its relevance might be to the actual whole cell electrophysiology. So we, this is an, an experiment we uh, used a rat adult ventricular cell and we produced an action potential with a two millisecond polarizing pulse under the conditions of high uh, external sodium, 140 millivolts, uh, cesium, I'm sorry, and uh, we had 20 millivolts cesium internal. And the holding potential was minus 105 with a two millisecond polarizing step. And you clearly get a very nice <coughs> recognizable action potential which was blocked completely by 10 micromolar of uh, TTX. So just to summarize, hopefully I've given you some food for thought that there is in these rat cells and many, many others by infants a new certain current component that is widely seen. They contribute to the electrical behavior of these cells and actually are capable of producing action. And they really could provide the immediate trigger for the generation of the cardiac action potential under physiological conditions. The future directions are clearly to figure out what gene is responsible for this. And with that knowledge, then we can really begin to explore what the significance is in normal physiology in cytokine cells, certainly in cardiac cells, but also in the neurologic preparations where it's been found, but also what could this contribute to abnormal um, uh, excitability both in cardiac cells and in neurologic preparation? Since it uh, is certainly earlier in the action potential generation by its uh, current voltage relationships in the classical sodium channel, uh, even if it's not a source of arrhythmias in the heart, it could be a target that could attenuate or ameliorate. ameliorate. So I think that has some very, very interesting the other thing is, what about gene defects and whatever gene controls ICATTLs? Could it be responsible for some specific uh, uh, heritable uh, arrhythmias for which we don't know uh, the genetic cause, like Brugada syndrome or a number of others, of which only a small portion of the known uh, patients with that can be identified uh, as single gene defects in certain ion channels? So I think there's a lot of potential. And then if you extrapolate it into the neurologic cells where this is found, I think it becomes pretty much open-ended to the significance So I, I think this is a real fabulous opportunity. I can't wait to get going on it. So that's where we are. And I, I appreciate your patience for this perhaps too tedious uh, dissection of these two different sort of do you think that um, do you think that the sun can play any role in excitation contraction cutting in muscle? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so, I definitely think so. A whole series of experiments and, uh, that I would like to do, besides the ones we just said, is it would be very nice to image the calcium that comes through here. Where does it go? Is it the same micro domain that the L-type calcium current influences around the receptor? Well, we don't know. If you're don't. there, are they in the tubules? Yeah, we don't know any of that. And I think calcium and sodium come into this channel for a reason. I think those are messengers for some processes in the cell. What they are, I think, is, is anybody's best guess. And uh, I think that is another set of projects based on this that would be incredibly just, you know, just from a normal physiology perspective, let alone what it could imply in uh, <coughs> having physiological preparations. Please. So, do you have any, if you, if you go through, you look at um, 24 domain protein, do you have any candidates just by looking at? Yeah, I, I, there, there are, we have a couple candidates. I started to look at this, actually there's about four or five. I started to look at this in great detail several years ago before I made my little digression into that administrative nightmare, which I've given up. Uh, I need to do this in a lot more sophisticated way. The classification of these channels has gotten much more uh, complex and I think more accurate. 
and we need to really start thinking about how we're going to do this. I don't think oligonucleotides is necessarily the best way to pursue this identification. There are many more powerful and efficient ways of doing this. But I think that's probably the key thing, is to try to use the biophysical biomarkers of the footprint of this channel with various uh, attempts at identifying its genetic makeup. And then once you have some candidates for that, or even some likely candidates for that, then it opens up all kinds of experiments. And that's kind of where I'm stuck here. I mean, where I was and where we were in Baltimore, we didn't have that capability at the time. And then I got diverted. And I couldn't think of a better city or a better place to be where all of that capability exists. So hopefully, uh, you know, once we get up and running this spring, we'll, we'll be able to come back in a year or a year and a half Any other questions, comments? So is the dose response curve for TTX different? You commented that the current is completely blocked by 10 microvolt TTX, but in rat ventricular cells or most ventricular cells, you don't have anywhere near a complete block of 10 Of the classical sodium current. It's almost impossible to block. So you're saying that the pharmacological sensitivity is different? Very different. For the only ones we've tested are uh, TTX, and it's completely, if I see a TTX under conditions where you're not contaminated with the classical sodium current, it's completely long with 10 micromolar. But, you know, I think it's as much as 50 micromolar uh, yeah, sure. on classical sodium, and you can never get it down. In fact, sometimes, I mean, I was very naive when I started on my postdoc, but I was trying to get it down so I could control the plant, but I just could never use enough yeah, sure. TTX to do it. So are there any other channels, I guess similar to John's question, are there any other channels that, that are, have, are, have been shown to have a TTX sensitivity that are not in that? No, yeah. not that I know. That I, I, not, and I don't know it because I think there are many of the other isoforms that are out there haven't been tested in this way. So that's not to say that some of them, you know, that TTX, differential TTX sensitivity, I don't think is going to be very much all of them. If, if it has, I don't know. It, at least it wasn't available to us. It might be now, and then we can use that as a way to hone in on, on the targets. Has that been done? Well, I mean, some of the neuronal channels are because they're much, much. Have you done a whole dose response curve? You know that you have Most normal channels, it would be in NAD1.2 or NAD1.1. And the gauge, the persistent sodium current on the gauge channel is in the normal range for TTX. Okay, thank you very much.